The urinary system is a hugely important system in our body for controlling a lot of our uh, homeostasis um, effects. It controls fluid balance, it controls blood pressure, um, it controls, it's a big part of the control for electrolyte and acid base um, balance. It um, secretes erythropoietin, with, which um, stimulates red blood cell uh, production. So huge, big deal. We're going to go over um, just a really tiny bit about um, its normal function, um, and then we're going to go right into um, tests and dialysis and uh, disorders, and finally end with renal failure. So um, interesting stuff. So the urinary system removes metabolic wastes. It removes excess hormones from the body. It removes drugs and other foreign material from the body. So just like the liver um, it is uh, responsible for metabolizing all the drugs, the urinary system does as well. Um, it regulates water, electrolyte, and acid-base balance and secretes erythropoietin um, to stimulate red blood cell production. It activates vitamin D. That's huge. Vitamin D is actually um, now considered more of a hormone than a vitamin. And it's vital for neurological function, for calcium um, metabolism, and um, for a lot of other functions in our body. So um, it's a big deal. Um, the urinary system also regulates blood pressure through the renin, angiotensin, and aldosterone system. So a um, very vital system. We can't survive without it. Um, we'll see what happens when uh, things go wrong. So a uh, super simple anatomy. Um, the kidneys drain into the ureters, which go to the urinary bladder, um, which stores urine to be then uh, released through the urethra. Easy squeezy, right? This is from the book um, on page 491, The Gross Anatomy of the Urinary System. Um, one of the things that I like about this picture is it shows where the kidneys are located. Um, for one thing, they're uh, superior to where the um, bladder is located. The bladder is low in the pelvic cavity. The kidneys are very high. They're kind of up underneath the ribs in the retroperitoneal space. So they're behind the peritoneal cavity. And um, they're higher than you would think. So the kidney is a super cool organ. Um, one thing, kind of like the, the liver, which is also very important, um, something you can't live without, um, the kidney has a lot of functional units. The liver has lobules, the um, kidney has nephrons, and each kidney has over a million nephrons. So when um, kidneys are starting to go bad, um, you actually don't see effects until a lot of the nephrons are non-functional. So um, with adult polycystic kidney disease that we talked about in the genetics chapter. Um, it, it doesn't um, seem to have an effect until later in life when a lot of the kidney is affected. So um, we also have some redundancy in the system. It's such an important system, it's important that we have that redundancy. We have two kidneys, but we really only need one. So if my sister needed a kidney and the tissue matches were right, um, I could donate one of my kidneys to her and um, she and I could get along with one each. So um, super important system and um, the redundancy helps protect all of those vital functions that it regulates. So um, talking about urinary incontinence and retention, um, incontinence is loss of voluntary control of the bladder. So. When we're children, of course, when we're developing, when we're younger than four years old, um, it takes a while to um, develop the neurological mechanisms that give us voluntary control of our bladder. And um, it's the same thing with animals. Um, when you're trying to house train your dog, if you have a puppy, if they're below a certain age, they just haven't developed the neurological systems for voluntary control of the bladder yet. So. Um, incontinence is loss of that. Um, enuresis is involuntary urination by a child um, age older than four years. So older than four years, hopefully they have developed the neurological systems for voluntary control, but it could be related to developmental delay, so they haven't developed those systems yet. It could be de um, 
related to a super deep sleep pattern that children sometimes have and they're not um, awakened um, by the urge to urinate um, or their psychosocial aspects and it's treated in children depending on what the cause is. Um, stress incontinence, it can happen in men and women, although it is more common in women. Increased intra-abdominal pressure forces urine through the sphincter. Um, coughing, lifting, laughing, sneezing um, can uh, cause stress incontinence. Uh, multiple pregnancies um, can cause stress incontinence as well. That's probably why it's more common in women. Um, overflow incontinence is um, an incompetent bladder sphincter um, and it frequently happens in older adults. So the weakened detrusor muscle may prevent complete emptying of the bladder and so it results in um, the frequent urge to urinate and incontinence. Spinal cord injuries or brain damage can result in neurogenic bladder. So the bladder can either be spastic where it's hard to control um, or flaccid where it just doesn't um, work to release the urine. Um, interference with central nervous system and autonomic nervous system voluntary controls of the bladder can also cause incontinence. Um, urinary retention is the inability to empty the bladder and it may be accompanied by overflow incontinence. Just the pressure from the full bladder um, makes it so the uh, sphincter muscle can't hold the bladder shut. Spinal cord injury at the sacral level um, blocks the micturition reflex, which is the um, reflex to empty the bladder. Um, it also may follow a general or spinal anesthesia after surgery. So a lot of times when you're working in the acute care setting, um, nursing has a procedure where they have a bladder scanner. It's a little, it's a small um, ultrasound imaging device, and they can see. Um, if there's urinary retention and whether the person needs um, either one-time catheterization or ongoing catheterization. So if they need ongoing catheterization, they might um, implant a Foley catheter. A lot of times um, when people are under general anesthesia and surgery, they'll put the Foley catheter in in surgery. Um, so then they uh, can do it in a sterile environment and they don't have to worry about introducing um, potential for infection. So um, when I worked in acute care, I've got to say my record is intact. I've never unintentionally uh, or intentionally pulled out someone's Foley catheter. I'd like to keep that record um, standing. So diagnostic tests for um, the urinary system, the first one is urinalysis. So they look at the appearance of the urine and then they test some of the chemical properties and they look at it under the microscope. So what they're looking for in normal urine is straw colored with a mild odor um, and a specific gravity from 1.010 to 1.050. Um, if it's cloudy, it might indicate the presence of large amounts of protein, blood bacteria, or pus. So those can indicate all sorts of different problems. Um, if it's a dark color, it may indicate um, hematuria, which is blood in the urine, excessive bilirubin, or highly concentrated urine, which can be a, a result of dehydration or renal failure. Um, an unpleasant or unusual order, um, odor can result from infection or certain dietary components or medication. So um, heavy uh, purulence and presence of gram-negative and gram-positive organisms um, that it can be an indicative of a urinary infection, um, looking at it underneath the microscope. So um, if there's blood in the urine, which is uh, hematuria, um, small amounts can indicate infection, inflammation, or possibly tumors in the urinary tract. Large amounts can um, indicate increased glomerular uh, permeability or hemorrhage. Um, elevated protein levels, which are uh, referred to as uh, proteinuria or albuminuria, um, it can be caused by leakage of albumin or mixed plasma proteins into the filtrate. So um, that can be an, um, an osmotic problem um, caused by a lot of different disease processes. Um, bacteriuria is bacteria. It's an infection in the urinary tract. So urinary casts, which are um, basically, it's like the skeleton of red blood cells in the urine, um, that can indicate inflammation of kidney tubules. 
Um, the specific gravity um, of urine indicates the ability of the tubules to concentrate the urine. So if you have low specific gravity, it's dilute. Um, if you have high specific gravity, it's concentrated. So that high specific gravity urine um, can be related to renal failure. Um, presence of glucose and ketones in the urine are found when you have um, diabetes mellitus that is not well controlled. Um, a lot of people with diabetes are trained to um, test their urine for glucose and ketones with little dipsticks that um, change colors if you have high levels of uh, glucose or ketones. So this is a microscopic uh, a micrograph of red blood cell casts in the urine um, and that could be indicative of the um, inflammation in the kidney tubules. Um, the, with the blood tests, elevated serum urea, which is also called um, BUN, blood nitrogen urea, and serum creatinine levels might indicate failure to excrete nitrogen wastes. Um, and that can be caused by decreased uh, glomerular filtration rate, also known as GFR. Uh, metabolic acidosis can indicate decreased GFR. Um, failure of tubules to control the acid-base balance. Um, anemia can indicate decreased erythropoietin secretion and or bone marrow depression. So it could be either there's not enough of the hormone being secreted or it's being secreted but the bone marrow is not responding to it. And all of the, the metabolic acidosis and the anemia, um, that is in the absence of other problems. There might be other things causing metabolic acidosis or anemia. So in the absence of other problems, it could indicate those particular issues with the urinary system. Um, electrolytes can be uh, related to fluid balance. So um, those are tested, blood levels are tested of those. Antibody levels. Um, the antistreptolysin O or antistreptokinase um, are used for diagnosis of uh, post-streptococcal glomerulonephritis, which is an inflammatory disease of the kidneys. Um, elevated renin levels indicate um, the kidney as a cause of hypertension. So there's something going wrong with that um, renin angiotensin aldosterone cycle um, causing hypertension. Other tests that might be done, um, culture and sensitivity studies on urine specimens to identify causative organisms of infection and to help select the appropriate drug treatment. Um, radiologic tests include uh, radionuclide imaging, angiography, um, ultrasound, CT scans, MRIs, and intravenous um, pyelography, which is imaging of the kidney. Um, they inject a dye into the urinary system and they can see what's going on in the kidneys. Um, they use those to visualize the kidney structures and possible abnormalities um, to visualize flow patterns um, and filtration rates. So um, clearance tests, sometimes they will do creatinine or um, insulin, um, inulin clearance tests to assess glomerular filtration rate. Um, basically they have you um, keep all your urine for a certain amount of time and they see in, the, in, you t in different containers and you test over time um, how quickly the, urine, the insulin, uh, inulin or creatinine are um, clearing from the urine. Um, cytoscopy in, visualizes the lower urinary tract, or cystoscopy, excuse me, um, and the bladder, and it, um, they can use it to perform a biopsy or remove kidney stones if the kidney stones are um, low enough to be able to remove. Um, kidney biopsies are used to acquire tissue specimens to look for um, abnormal tissue growth. So a lot of times diuretic drugs are used to remove excess sodium ions and water from the body. So sometimes they're used for a lot of different things to control um, edema, to control blood pressure. Um, it, they increase the excretion of water through the kidneys and they reduce fluid volume in the tissues and blood. So they're prescribed for a lot of different things, for renal disease, for hypertension, edema, congestive heart failure, liver disease, and pulmonary edema. Um, there are several different mechanisms um, that increase urine volume based on individual specific drugs. 
Um, some drugs are considered potassium wasting where they throw potassium out the window and some are potassium sparing. So um, we know the importance of potassium um, in the cardiac cycle and some of the other functions in the body. So when you're on these diuretic drugs, it's really important to get regular blood monitoring to make sure your um, electrolyte levels are staying within normal limits. So this is examples of um, diuretic drugs. Um, hydrochlorothiazide is often used um, in hypertension and congestive heart failure and generalized edema. Um, Lasix is a really common one that's used in congestive heart failure, edema, and renal disease. Um, so you can look at the different ones. Um, there are certain ones that are um, that target certain areas, and there's some that are more generalized. Um, Lasix and um, HCTZ is what they call hydrochlorothiazide. Um, tend to be more generalized. They're used for a lot of different things. And then some of the other ones tend to be more specific for certain um, disorders. So when your kidneys aren't working, so your kidneys, um, their job is, uh, I mean, one of their many jobs is to provide filtration for the blood and reabsorption of electrolytes. Um, so if your kidneys aren't doing it, you need some external um, system for doing it. And that's what dialysis basically is. It's an external system for doing things when your kidneys are failing. Um, there are two forms of dialysis, hemodialysis and peritoneal dialysis, and we'll talk about the two different forms. Um, they are considered life-sustaining treatments during kidney failure. Um, they're used to treat patients with acute kidney failure until the primary problem is reversed. And they're also used for patients in end-stage renal failure until either a kidney transplant is available um, and is successful or something else happens, usually death. But um, a lot of times, too, they might um, dialysize a patient in the hospital with acute kidney failure um, just to take the load, the chemical load, off their body. Um, so it's, um, you'll see more and more in an acute care setting, people on temporary dialysis. Um, so when, you have, when you're having chronic renal failure or end-stage renal failure, um, you're, you have to be on dialysis for life or until you get a kidney transplant. Um, for acute kidney failure, though, it might just be for a short amount of time. So um, with dialysis, um, the blood is uh, moved through a semipermeable membrane, and some of the um, things that the kidneys usually remove are taken out of the blood, and then the blood is put back into the body. This is with hemodialysis. So hemodialysis is usually done in a hospital or in an, on an outpatient setting in a dialysis center or sometimes at home with special equipment and training or some uh, like a home health nurse. Um, the patients usually um, when someone's on long-term dialysis they have an implanted shunt or catheter um, and it's moved from the implanted shunt in an artery to the machine. The machine exchanges waste fluids and electrolytes. There's a semi-permeable membrane between the blood and the dialysis fluid, which is called um, uh, the diacyl, di, di, I can't say it, dialysate. Um, the blood cells and the proteins remain in the blood. So only the electrolytes and waste and fluids are exchanged. So after the exchange is completed, the blood is returned to the patient's vein. So when they have a hemodialysis port, they have two openings. One is in the vein and one is in the artery. The blood's taken from the artery, goes through the machine, and then it's put back in the vein. Um, usually people have to do it up to three times a week, and each dialysis session lasts for three to four hours. So it's a hugely time-consuming um, thing, but it's the, uh, it's the alternative to death. So, you know, how much time do you want to invest in that, I guess? Um, there are a lot of potential complications. Um, because you have that implanted um, shunt, it may become infected. Um, you may be prone to blood clots. Um, blood vessels involved in the shunt can become sclerosed or damaged. 
Um, the patient has an increased risk of infection with hepatitis B, hepatitis C, or HIV if standard precautions are not followed. So, um, of course, we always want to follow standard precautions. That's why they're standard. So here's a little graphic from the book. The blood goes from the artery, it goes through the pump, um, it diffuses the waste products out, um, goes through the membrane, and it goes back into the vein. Um, the second picture here is the um, other type of dialysis, which we'll talk about. It's peritoneal dialysis. It's usually done on an outpatient basis, and it can be done at night during sleep or while the patient is ambulatory. Um, the peritoneal membrane serves as a semipermeable membrane, so a catheter with exit and entry points is implanted into the peritoneal cavity, and the, di um, the, the dialyzing fluid is instilled into the cavity. Um, the dialysate is drained from the cavity via gravity into the container. So um, I met a guy one time who was undergoing peritoneal dialysis for chronic renal failure, and um, he said he used to sit, you have to put, um, there's a gravity um, flow in it, so you have to have, during parts of it, you have to have the bag higher than your body, and during parts of it, you have to have the bag lower than your body. So he said, he, and it takes hours to do this. So he said he would hook up to the, um, the dialysis bag, and he would sit in his truck and put the bag up on top on the roof when it had to be higher and then he would stick it on the floor of the cab when it had to be lower and it worked that worked really well for him he would sit in his truck and he would listen to the radio and you know read and <laughs> do some other stuff so obviously that's a little bit more um, maybe easier than hemodialysis for home treatment and you can um, you know make it suit you um, a lot of times people do it at night while they're sleeping so um, the drawbacks of peritoneal dialysis is it takes more time than hemodialysis. Um, it requires loose clothing because you have to accommodate a bag of fluid. Um, a major complication is the um, chance of getting an infected, or infection resulting in peritonitis. There's peritonitis again. And of course that can kill you. Um, with both types of dialysis, um, people are put on antibiotics um, to uh, prophylactically to prevent potential problems. Um, sometimes people, um, if they get infected, um, it might, might alter their dialysis requirements. They might need it more often. They might have to go in every day. So um, a lot of drugs can become toxic because the kidney is not eliminating them because the kidney is not working when you get to this point. So um, you're into a very serious uh, area of treatment here when you're um, talking about um, dialysis. So a lot of times when you're in an inpatient setting and people are on dialysis, you're having to work their um, treatment schedule, their PT treatment schedule, around their dialysis schedule. Some people are um, a lot more tired after they get back from dialysis. Um, you have to work out with them. And people that are getting dialysis on an outpatient basis, you have to work out what works best for their energy level and their schedule um, to come up with a good treatment schedule for them.